How do you like this photo? Is it not amazing? I think it's a fantastic photo. But uh, if I may ask a question, who owns it? I mean, who owns this photo? Is it the Maasai woman whose image has been captured? Or is it the camera man, the photographer? Or is it the printing office or bureau that has turned the photo into a postcard? The question of ownership of photographs, images, inventions, and all ideational resources is probably not a very relevant question to indigenous communities, such as the Maasai, where the beautiful lady comes from. However, when this question is asked in the context of our Western uh, society, it brings into the discussion the not so familiar concepts of intellectual property and personality rights or the right of publicity. Let me explain these concepts briefly and I'll start with intellectual property. All property in the world can be grouped into three. Movable property such as cars, immovable property, particularly land and things fixed permanently on it, like some houses, and intellectual property, meaning property emanating from creativity. This is when you turn your ideas into something we can relate to, such as a book, a drawing, a carving, or any form of technology. Copyright, patents, and trademarks are the main types of intellectual property meaning the main legal instruments that protect creativity and invention in the arts, technology, and entrepreneurship or businesses, respectively. For a long time, intellectual property have been a part. In fact, the patent system is at the cornerstone or it's at the corner of wealth creation in the West. Giving an example of the US, the first patent was issued in the year 1790, shortly after independence, uh, to Samuel Hopkins for a process of manufacturing fertilizer. And guess what? The patent document was signed by two founding fathers of the US, uh, President Judge Washington and Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, one document. And later on, uh, President Abraham Lincoln said that uh, the patent system adds the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. This can give you a picture of how important intellectual property has been and still is in most of the Western uh, societies. And it has actually had very, very successful uh, stories. When it comes to publicity rights, again, I will give examples from the US. Although the recognition of this right is much more recent than in continental Europe where it actually started and where it is known as the right uh, personality rights. Many people have used this legal mechanism to claim thousands of dollars for unauthorized use of their names, pictures, images. And uh, examples include real people, not, not hypothetical, like Tiger Woods, the late Muhammad Ali, and many other celebrities have actually gone to court to say, hi, why did you use my likeness without my consent? You can see the list 
in, uh, has more, many celebrities, but actually the law is not confined to celebrities. Anyone can walk into the court and say, I need compensation for uh, unauthorized use of my identity or my likeness. Now here is a paradox. The same legal system, the same legal instruments that foster creativity and innovation and protects identities of individuals in the north is working against indigenous communities. From the Maori in New Zealand to the Maasai in the near the Serengeti Plains, intellectual property is actually misappropriating the culture of indigenous communities. Before I give specific examples on how this is done, I need to put it clear that intellectual property issues are not entirely new to the continent. In fact, out of 55 countries that make up the African continent, each one of them has at least two intellectual property offices, one working on copyright issues and another on industrial property, meaning patent, trademark, and the rest. And each of these countries employs at least 10 full-time staff. So if you take 10 times 55, you have more than half a million of uh, IP battalion paid by taxpayers, including taxes paid by indigenous communities, even though this very system is actually misappropriating from the indigenous communities. I want to give three examples, but please note that these are purely hypothetical and even the names that I use should not be taken to actually point to a specific person. Here is Mr. Smith, a national of Germany. He comes to a village of Ngopang in Gorongoro. He learns of the use of Maasai medicine known as Orconyil for treating uh, intestinal illnesses. He gets interested and he takes just a little bit of this herbal medicine with him to Germany and through some research in a lab discovers that actually Orconyl can treat diabetes. Here is Judith from the US. She comes to another Maasai village in Kiteto. She attends traditional ceremonies where she actually records or takes films and pictures and uh, later on produces a wonderful musical uh, CD and becomes a bestseller. The third example here is John from the UK. He's an entrepreneur. He comes to Tanzania and partners with a local to start a tour company. He learns from conversations that there are people called Maasai who are very popular with tourists. So he decides to take a Maasai name and a photograph of a Maasai warrior and a, even a traditional name and he makes it a part of his brand. Lo and behold, the current intellectual property system with its Western origin rewards Smith and Judith and John with intellectual property rights in the form of a copyright and a patent and a trademark. The Maasai community is left out and if they want this medicine from Smith, they need to pay. Go to a local drugstore, pay for this medicine, which actually comes from your knowledge, your trees, your uh, genetic resources. And if they like the music, they do the same by going to a nearby shop music. 
by the way, that's how I got to buy my uncle's photograph in the form of a postcard downtown Arusha. I cannot overemphasize that this system is unjust and is harming indigenous communities. There are some obvious differences between the Western intellectual property system and the indigenous or indigenous communities or heritage, uh, the cultural heritage uh, protection. For example, in the West, one person is regarded as a hero given a patent for having discovered something. Or one singer is regarded as uh, the superstar. In the Maasai culture, we are all superstars. We have all made this folk music and we all share the knowledge for treatment of certain diseases. Secondly, most intellectual property rights are time bound. Copyright, for example, lasts for only 50 years after the death of the author. This is not the case with indigenous heritage. The culture lasts as long as the community is there. The UN has finally come to the realization that uh -uh, this system is unjust. As a result, the World Intellectual Property Organization towards the end of 1990s started a division known as Traditional Knowledge Division, which is gearing towards putting down a system that will recognize the rights of indigenous communities to their knowledge and culture. Likewise, the Nagoya Protocol on Traditional Knowledge has come out of this UN or multilateral uh, discussions for recognition of the rights of indigenous communities. As much as this system is moving at an extremely low pace, there is hope at the end of the tunnel that someday indigenous communities around the world will have some legal protection against the Smiths the Judith, and the Johns of our times, including multilateral companies. There is hope. My call to you, and this actually is divided into two. First, to policymakers around the world who may probably watch this video, and then to each one of you in this room. To policymakers, especially those that represent their countries in the UN meetings, would you please take time to learn and ensure that indigenous people's issues, especially those, those related to their culture, are given the right attention? Would you please speed up the process so that there is a system at the global level and automatically it will trickle down to specific countries to protect cultures of indigenous communities. And to each one of us, would you please take a moment and learn ABCs about intellectual property, personality rights, the right of publicity, and ensure that whatever you do does not harm or injure in any way the interest of indigenous communities. Here in Arusha, because we are a gateway to the Serengeti and other major national parks, tourists come and invade Maasai villages armed with cameras. They take all photos they want and they use in whichever way they want, including selling back to me in a postcard. <laughs> Things that they surely cannot do it in major cities in the West, such as downtown Washington, D.C., or even Berlin or London. You are always welcome, but try to ensure that the power you have of technology does not encroach and actually 
uh, marginalized further indigenous communities. Asante ni sana.